Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our event, Meet a Deaf Person today. Our very special honored guest for today. Her name is Laura Godbold. And we're really thrilled to have her here with us. She's going to speak on the topic today about Usher's syndrome. Only limited on Usher's syndrome? No, we're not going to be. It's going to be a broad whole person as to who Laura is, who she is, how Usher's syndrome has impacted her life and her life besides Usher's syndrome. So before we get started and get into this topic, I wanted to start of knowing who are you, Laura? Hello, everyone. My name is Laura Godbold. Thanks so much for asking me. I'm honored to be here and to engage with all of you today. I grew up in New Jersey. And in 2004, my family moved to Florida. At the time, I was a Gallaudet student. I was in my bachelor program and graduated in 2005. And of course, immediately went into my master's program, graduated in 2007. So I was mainstreamed growing up. I had never gone to a deaf school. So I started out in pre-K at an oral school. And then I think that was roughly a, a, a that was like 10 students, if I'm not mistaken. I was uh, the only one of my kind until I got into high, and then I mainstreamed in high school. When I got to Gallaudet, that was quite the transition and, and a, a rather big challenge. But I graduated and then got a job. My first job was at the University of North Florida, UNF. And I worked with deafblind interpreting because there were students that wanted to learn how to do deafblind interpreting in the community. I was able to instruct them in that very specialized profession. So that was a, that's a four year program. Then after I worked there, I, I it was tough. <laughs> I moved to Arkansas. We're getting some clarification from Briella to Laura, Laura asking her, is it Arkansas or Kansas? I was in Arkansas. Yeah, I went from Florida to Arkansas. I was there for a year, went, then came to Alabama. My, my husband is deaf as well. He went to the deaf school in Alabama, but there wasn't any work in Arkansas. Gratefully, he got a job in uh, the, at Carolina University, that's in North Carolina, the program is an online program. So he was able to work from home. This is his second year. Like I said, my husband is also deaf. We've been married for 10 years. We have two children. I have a son named, it was his name, Ezra. And then my daughter named Cindy. I am a deaf blind person. And so we do things a little bit different. We have a deaf, deaf blind culture in my home. Oh, that's wonderful. That sounds like a wonderful way to start to introduce your background. So I'm wondering, let's go back to when you were born. Because as you know, in Tennessee, I'm the Tennessee Deaf Mentor focusing on age zero to five. And so looking back, can you explain a little bit about how your parents reacted when they found out that you were deaf or how did you know that you were deaf? Were you born deaf? Did you lose your hearing later? Well, that's a good question. I was born deaf. My parents were in shock as most hearing parents are because they had no experience with deaf people deaf culture, nor the language. They placed me in an oral school straight out of the gate. And I did that for some time. Communication was non-existent to be honest with you. 
I, I really don't remember it, but my mom has told me some stories. And I think it was the summer right before grade school. Well, let me back up just a smidge. I was 18 months old and the doctor uh, diagnosed me with Usher syndrome. So I, I was deaf and had Usher syn syndrome by the 18 months old. So I go into first grade and it was a deaf program. And the, the teacher of that program explained to my parents about the program that they had. And, you know, the communication at the oral school wasn't working. It was a lot of frustration. So they decided to place me in the first grade in the deaf program. And that's where I learned American Sign Language. And I was already six years old by this time, which means I had minimal, if any, language prior to that age. So that was my first exposure to American Sign Language. My mom, my cousin took classes in American Sign Language. And of course, we've been be able to communicate ever since. So I know some people in the audience might be saying, what is Usher syndrome? What is Usher syndrome? Deaf and Usher syndrome, are they the same? Are they different? What exactly does that mean? Well, Usher syndrome, is related to my eyes. Specifically, it's called retinit retinitis pigmentosa. It's uh, two very big words. We call it RP and it has to do with the eyes. Then you add the deafness on top of it. it, it it's, 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 a, it's a double whammy. So I was a deaf and usher syndrome. So really basically what it means my peripheral vision is non-existent and very much only in the front of my face. I don't see anything off to the side. There are three types of Usher syndrome. There's type one, type two, and type three. I happen to have type one. I was born profoundly deaf. And so my hearing was non-existent. And then at a young age, I was diagnosed with Usher syndrome. And my vision has slow, my vision slowly digressed, you know, and they noticed it in my balance, especially as a toddler walking around. The second type of Usher syndrome is a person is generally born hard of hearing and then later on at some age, possibly a teenager, they might be diagnosed with Usher syndrome. And normally that individual's balance is just fine because they've not had it until later. Third type of Usher syndrome, person is born hearing with perfect sight. And then over time, the hearing and the sight digress at the same time. And then they find out. So there's three levels. I have type one. Mm -hmm. So that's really interesting. I did not know there were three different levels. So I know people with Usher syndrome typically are born and their vision uh, digresses through the years, but I've also heard that you could manifest, it can manifest in different ways. It could be completely closed and then open up, or it could be dots, or it could come in from the top and the bottom or from the sides. So is that true or does it just vary on individual? Is it basically the same? No, it's definitely not the same for everyone. But people will say, what kind of Usher syndrome do you have? Do you have floaters? Are you looking through something like Swiss cheese? Are you looking through something like an arc or do you only see a small box? Do you see a large circle? What is it that you're looking through when you look through your eyes? But it's definitely restricted. For me, I have what I would call a box that I can see through. For example, you know how car windows are on the side and they have blind spots over your right and left shoulder. That blind spot would encase, encapsulate what my vision is like on a daily basis. Oh. Some people uh, have a, a light is not an issue for them. For other people, light is an issue. And for me, I'm one of those people. 
So it, my, my vision can close up on me very quickly without me knowing, depending on the light source. Okay, so when you were identified with Escher syndrome, and of course you were deaf, so how did your parents support you in the best way that they could? Do you think, can you think of a couple of things that wow, really benefited you now that you know, you're know you really thankful to your parents for? Well, first of all, the sign exposure in the home was absolutely the best, whether it was tactile or American Sign Language. If I had continued in an oral program, Lord knows how well I would have turned out or how much I would have learned, but they did put me into a deaf program and I learned sign language. I didn't completely have a full understanding of my Usher syndrome diagnosis as a young age. I just knew that I have it. And it wasn't until 13 or 14 years old that I had an understanding of what was going on. I thought I could just so see fine. It was normal for me. And I did my thing as a kid does. I knew I was deaf. Okay, I can work with that. But and then as a teenager, I realized, oh, my eyes are different because I had gone to the eye doctor a lot, but it didn't really strike me until I was a teenager. So when I, I went to the eye doctor, they did some extensive testing on me and um, they said, you know, she, she is really technically blind. And I was, I, I, I was like, what? And my parents were also uh, shocked, but, and cried. And, and there was grief, of course. Um, they were devastated, but we kept a positive outlook on life. And, and, you know, it's normal to have grief and it's normal to have some anger and, you know, but it's, a, it, you have to go through the stages of grief and then get to the other side. So when I graduated high school and went into Gallaudet, it was very beneficial for me because there were other people who became my friends that had Usher syndrome. I was involved in the deaf blind community and, and met people there. And so that experience was definitely beneficial. Just first going into Gallaudet, I, I realized, oh, there are other people that are just like me. And I was 21 at the time, you know, I had my, um, I, I had my driver's license and I had to give it up at that time. But I was so excited to take the driver's test. And I think, what was it? Oh, let me think of what, was I 17 years old? I think I was. I was super excited to drive as everyone is at that age. And then what was it? Three, yeah, three years, 17, three, yeah, three years. I was in a, in a car accident and realized, oh, yikes, I, I think I might be a risk to other people and had to decide to give up my driver's license. Not an easy thing to do. But I was in Gallaudet at the time, which is in Washington, DC. And I saw, you know, that they had ample transportation for people. And that was very helpful. And it gave me my confidence back as a deaf blind person. Wow. So really you're thankful to your parents for involving you in the signing community. You had mentioned that you were in ASL and something called tactile, protactile. Uh, I don't know if our audience is familiar with what that means. Could you expand a little bit more on that? Sure. Tactile or protactile. I, well, I, I didn't learn those until much later. I was in Gallaudet when I learned tactile and then protactile is relatively new. It's actually just showed up on the scene recently. It's uh, coming for, what is it, 2008? So 2008, 2010, somewhere along those lines, what protactile started showing up. So I was in Gallaudet learning tactile sign language or tactile, which is a, somebody's hand, another person's hand, under one of my hands, and they sign underneath my hand. So normal in American Sign Language, we see with our eyes but the other person's, but I don't. So a person is to my side with their hand and they are signing in ASL under my hand. And I, of course, not if I understand or, or not, or if I shake my head, if I don't, it's, it's a bit of a change, you know, from learning ASL, but it is, it's different, but it's the same. So you see ASL with your hand right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is the sign for it. If you can see what I'm signing here, that is the sign for tactile sign language or I'm seeing with my hand. So tactile 
So what about protactile? Is there a difference between the two? Protactile, we call it PRTL. It's, it's like a supportive language. And it, there's all different kinds of, if there's information that is given a different part on different parts of the arm. I love protactile and you know, my husband, for exa example, if we're watching television, cause I can't see it, or I don't know what's going on with my, with, I don't know what's going on. We can, we use protactile to give it, I'm, and I'm showing my arm here because that's how we do it. That's how we engage in the protactile way of signing. So I remember when I was a Gallaudet student, I had a deafblind student in my class and they used protactile, a protactile interpreter. And I remember one thing that they did, which was I thought was really cool and helpful in the classroom. So how the classroom was set up, we were set up like a C and yeah, I'm her picture is frozen, frozen on our end as well. Laura's frozen. Hello. <laughs> Let's all do the wave. There we go. Okay. Oh, hey, hey. Oh, you're kind of choppy. Maybe, I don't know if you can see me, but maybe you can leave and then come back to the meeting and maybe that will be helpful. Okay. Sorry about that, folks, for the screw up. You know, technology, what are you going to do? We're all over it after a year, right? With COVID. Okay, so, oh, I think I see her. It's just a black screen. Dang it. Oh, hello, hello. Yes, yes, yes. I can see you now. Perfect. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Not sure what happened. Sorry about that. But I'm glad you're back. Yay. Okay. So what was I saying? Oh, yeah. Our classroom, the seating was set up in the shape of a C. And when the deaf blind person was commenting, their interpreter would sit behind them and would touch on their back so that when another person across from them, from the deaf blind person would nod or would react in a positive or negative way, the interpreter would tap to let the person know that the person across them agreed with them. And I thought that was just fascinating. And really it was beautiful for me because it showed how evolution of the language matched anyone. Absolutely. And I've been in a number of lectures and workshops where protactile is used and the interpreter is touching my back. And it is uh, dependent on whatever people are saying. And, and they're, they're giving me information, which is super beneficial because when we were just using tactile and I was teaching and then there was an interpreter, I was constantly having to look to the interpreter saying, what were you saying? Or what was that comment or what? Oh, the student's laughing. Okay, fine. And I felt completely disengaged from everybody else, but it was pro tactile and having an interpreter behind me, it, it feels like somebody kind of scratching the back. So if it, you know, if a, a student is laughing, it's a, it's like a scratch and, and I am completely engaged. Um, you know, so if they kind of do like the scratch on my back, I know everyone is laughing and the presentation I can, you know, can keep going with the presentation because I'm involved. That is wonderful. So cool. So let me see. So I'm just curious with your journeys 
through learning with Usher syndrome and deafness. Is there anything that you wish that you did growing up? Something you wish that your parents did? Something that you wish you did yourself? Just in general, what do you wish that you're like, shoot, I wish I could change that? If there's anything. Well, as a deaf, I, I wish there were more young people because my parents didn't know. I mean, I can't blame them. But I, when I went to Gallaudet, it was a whole new world for me. And, and really, life kind of started there. At the time, I was learning how to be independent. And I was able to use, and the interpreter's not sure what that is. I was using a cane, a red-tipped cane. And so, you know, I, I, I was in the deaf blind community, which, which helped me, but at the same time, emotionally, I was, it was not such a good experience for me. Oh yeah. And I know that applies to anybody. Once you make that connection in the community, you feel the bond, you feel your identity, you feel that emotion of calm and stableness, that release. Oh, so I yeah, I get it. Totally yeah. get it. So I think if any of the families in our audience may have Usher syndrome or deafblind children, it's really important to make that connection with other deafblind children or with deafblind adults that can be a role model for them. Is that something that you would suggest as well? I agree. Yes. Connect, find other deafblind individuals, whether they're adults or children and introduce uh, your children so that they can have role models. And, and it's a definitely a boost in self-esteem when they do have these. Otherwise they feel very alone. And we, they have to have, there's so many, much accessible technology uh, other than just a cane these days. In addition, I definitely encourage, or I wish what had happened earlier for me is I, you know, of course I had this cane and I had the community but I, I don't, I didn't have what they have now. I get it. Access. I get it. The earlier, the better. Absolutely. Maybe even if a child doesn't need a cane right away, but still it's important to teach them earlier instead of having to transition to that later on. So now we're ready for a Q&A time. And again, I wanted to remind everyone to try uh, to let you know we're doing priority to families first with their questions. Once families have finished their questions, then I will be glad to open the floor to professionals. So are there any parents or family members that want to ask a question? Now's your chance. You can type it in the chat or you can open your screen and sign or voice, it's up to you. I'm gonna give you time to ask. One lady by the name of Kate says, thank you for sharing. I am the mother of a three-year-old with Usher syndrome, type two, two A. I'm assuming, has mild hearing loss, but no vision loss as of yet. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. Oh, okay. She said he wears hearing aids and he speaks and he signs some. She's still typing. So what resources do you think that we need to go ahead and connect him with at this young age? Because he's three. What is your suggestion? What kind of tips do you have? You got anything? Well, where does, if, if you don't mind if I ask, where does this child live? I'm assuming it's Tennessee. 
well, at three years old, by all means, expose the child to language. And we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but it will always benefit him or her to know ASL and tactile. I mean, at three years old, you know, and my son and daughter at the age, you know, they have a uh, full vision, but they still learned it, you know, because I'm their mom and you as the mom can start signing and using tactile with your child, even as the vision, you know, uh, goes. And it's really beneficial for it to start in the home. I know it can be frustrating, especially uh, if people can't communicate, but for my son and daughter and my, uh, my daughter, seven and a half, my son is nine. My son and I will uh, look outside the window and, you know, he'll see something and he'll, you take my hand and he'll, you know, do a, a gesture. And it means he saw something walking. And I, and, and so we can have that conversation. So I encourage pro tactile for, for the, for you and for the family to learn that for your three-year-old son. I have another question, but I wanted to make sure that you had wrapped up with the first one. Okay, Kate says, thank you, thank you. And another person by the name of Angela, Angie, she said, hello, I'm just wondering how exactly is Usher syndrome diagnosed? How does that happen? Okay, well, you have to go to an eye doctor and they do a number of tests. They use some sort of special something, technology, you know, to detect uh, retinitis pigmentosa or RP. And that's how they diagnose. I, I mean, my eyes fit the diagnosis for Usher syndrome, which is why they gave me that. And I was 18 months old when they diagnosed me. So really you have to go to the eye doctor. Yes, it's super important to have an eye, de eye test. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, why did your parents take you to the eye doctor at 18 months old? Was there, did they think there was something wrong or? Well, they noticed something wasn't quite right or wasn't normal. Also at night, I couldn't see. It's almost like I already was blind at night. So they brought me to the doctor and the doctor, you know, said she's fine, but then they brought me to the eye doctor and they found out something different. Thank you for that clarification. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Angela said, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and open the floor to professionals. Okay, I see Sharon Bryant has two questions. So, come on, Sharon. Hi, hi. I'm not sure if you can see me. Okay, great. Yeah, I enjoyed the, uh, the presentation and that your eye doctor could diagnose your eyes at 18 months old, that really surprises me. So how does an 18 month old, how, how can they do that? Yeah, I think there's some sort of drops they put in to dilate the eyes and then they use a specific something to test. I don't know if it's a pressure thing. I mean, I wanted to make sure that my children didn't, or my, excuse me, my daughter did not have it because um, she was 18 months old and I wanted to make sure that she did not have it. And they used some sort of, of equipment that had a red line and they would, and that red line would tell the, tell the eye doctor whether or not the child had RP or not, or Usher syndrome. Interesting. Or not. Great, and one more question. Any deaf blind camps? Oh, there's Are all there kinds of Are there any deaf blind camps? Yes. 
But my favorite deaf blind camp is Seabeck, yeah, in Washington State. I absolutely love it. And I've gone, I, the last time I was there was in 2005. Gosh, I wish I could go back again. Did they have it for children? Did they have it for children? You know, that's a good question. I'd, I'd have to look at what their age bracket is for attendance. But there are a number of different states that have deaf blind camps. Some accept children and some do not. Great, see you later. Okay, thank you. And I think it's really important to keep in the back of your mind that deaf blind camp is a great way for kids to meet other deaf blind people. So definitely, if you have a deaf blind child, take that opportunity, look for deaf blind resources. Absolutely. You can go online and, and there's in listings, but just heads up, some states don't have any at all. So that might mean you have to drive, but I regardless, it's beneficial to go. So Brenda has a question. I'm gonna open her video. Hello, hello, hello. Nice to okay, meet good. you. Okay, good, yeah. Oh, you're I too can... bright. Oh right. gosh, I'm working in the office. Can you sign it for me? Sure. Okay. So I wanted to clarify to our audience. Brenda is very bright. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to copy sign her to make sure everybody understands exactly what's going on. Thank you, thank you. So I'm wondering if Laura has her own SSP. What do you mean by SSP? Yes, it's a support service provider. I used to have my own SSP, but now that I'm in Florida, I, I might, you know, it's, it's a strange world. My best friend and I started working together. Gosh, time flies. I think it was 2016. So it was my second year working at UNF. We didn't know each other, but this is a, a deaf CDI and we connected. And she, it, this person's involved in the deaf blind community and technically serves kind of as an SSP for me. Then I moved to Alabama to Talladega. Talladega. And there was an agency just up the way from my house. And I didn't have, a, I didn't have an SSP, but I contacted them and they were able to send one to me or for me. I have another question. Can Laura explain or expound on what SSPs do for you? What an example of what they do? Sure. So support service provider is an individual that works with a deaf blind person, whether it's transportation to medical appointments or whatever the deaf blind person needs. And again, it's state specific on what they do and the policies are different depending on the state. In Alabama, the SSP at, from the agency would come pick me up, take me to a medical appointment, could take me to the bank, you name it. Cannot take me to the grocery store, which is fine. But I can go to the doctor and that person will guide me. Uh, first of all, we drive to the medical appointment. That person guides me by holding onto my elbow. We go into the medical office, make sure that there's an interpreter there. And the SSP is not an interpreter. Don't confuse the two. SSP and interpreter are two different individuals. Yes. So the interpreter then comes with me into the medical appointment and the SSP stays in the waiting room. Then the interpreter leaves and the SSP comes and takes me uh, or leads me back out. If I go to a restaurant or something, so, you know, like if I cannot see the, the what's on the menu, this person can help me know what's on the menu. So is, is that help out a little bit? Yes, thank you. Oh, something that just came to mind actually about an SSP. They, they do have specialized training.
there are workshops to learn how to be an SSP because it is a work. It is not an interpreter and um, SSPs focus on, you know, how to work with a deafblind individual. That's new to me. I'm glad that Brenda had asked that question. I learned something new. And I'm just wondering, how can you find information on SSPs? If I want to find one, what kind of agency should I be in contact with? Do you know a deafblind agency or what am I looking for? Each state or in the local area might have an SSP support service, support service provider agency. And you can see, you know, your location to see the name of the agency closest to you. So the key word is support service provider. Is that correct? Yeah, and then use agency. the word agency, yeah. So again, you know, in Arkansas, I was there for a year. There was an SSP agency, but they were rather limited. So, you know, again, you know, I. There, the policy was that they couldn't bring me to work and they could bring me to the doctor, but they could bring me to a grocery store or to a deaf blind event. So yikes, <laughs> talk about limited. But in Alabama, you know, they can take me to work. They can take me to a medical appointment and deaf blind events and things like that. But they cannot take me to a grocery store. I have no idea why not. Thank you for clarifying that. Brenda had made a comment in the chat that said Bridges for the deaf and hard of hearing is now currently working on setting up an SSP program and providing workshops. So that is in Nashville. Oh. And then for Knoxville, in the Knoxville area, they suggested contacting KCD, the Knoxville Center for the Deaf, because they also have SSPs there. That's great. So those are great suggestions that people in our audience are wanting to know more about SSP. So you can contact those two agencies. Thank you very much, Sharon and Brenda, for those comments. Okay, are there any other questions? We're nearing our time uh, to be up. So is there anything else? Any other questions? Good question from Connie. Is there any one thing that you wish all deaf mentor programs knew in relation to deaf blind, Usher syndrome, just in general? Okay, I'm sorry, say that again, just to clarify. So that, one wish for a deaf mentor program, like my program is the deaf program, deaf mentor program. So how can we support deaf blind children with Usher syndrome, families with deafblind, something that we should do. The deaf mentor program should include, it should encourage involvement in the deaf community. You know, because, and, and connecting with other people. The deaf, deaf mentor program also should have more information about access for deaf blind individuals. Those would be the two things. Oh yes, accessibility, to know how to provide accessibility to and different resources and knowledge in general. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Brenda had asked another question. What is the most challenging thing for you just in general? <laughs> Transportation, you know. Yikes. <laughs> yeah, that's the most challenging thing for me. I, I before I could drive, you know, all those years ago. And I miss it. I miss driving. You know, I can say to my husband, hey, could we, you know, just could we go somewhere, you know? Do you want me to drive? You know? <laughs> so I, I wish I could drive. I do. And you know, independence is a tough thing to transition from being independent to a little bit more dependent. And we want deafblind people to be independent. And I have to, you know, accept the fact that as I get older, my vision is decreasing and diminishing less than it was before, before I could see things and not so much anymore. So I noticed that you used the word or the sign. Sighted. sighted. 
that means a person that has normal vision and not Usher syndrome. So sighted. So me, technically me, I'm sighted. Yes. My husband and my children are also sighted. They do not have Usher syndrome. One thing that's important to know about the deafblind community, they don't only have Usher syndrome. There are many types of vision impairments. There's glaucoma. There, gosh, there is, ah, I can't think of, but there's just a whole myriad of, of visual impairments outside of Usher syndrome. And then Usher syndrome itself has its own different levels. So. Oh, yeah, I think that applies the same with the deaf community because there are different kinds right. of deafness and hearing loss. You have hard of hearing. Some people are profoundly deaf. Some people use a cochlear implant. Some people use a hearing aid. Some people use nothing. So that quote, cookie cutter, fits all, is not so. So it applies also to deaf and deaf blind. Yeah, for Thank sure. You. Cookie cutter, I like that analogy. That's great. Brenda has a comment. Okay, so I'm wondering if she goes, she has been to the Helen Keller school in New York because they have a school for yes, blind. Yes, I've been there one time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and have you learned to read Braille and in independent living and all of that? I have not yet learned to read Braille, but I am learning or I plan to learn. You know, my vision hasn't been bad and I was able to read just fine, you know, but, but now I cannot. I'm having to use a magnifier to assist me in reading. In addition, I have another piece of technology called a port something. Braille portable, digital. Portable. Yeah, it helps me and I can put it on a book and be able to see and know what that is so well, but I hope to learn braille soon that's the plan but I have been to the Helen Keller Center I think it was 2016 I was a student in okay yeah Brielle help me help me out with that one and haptics I was a student in haptics it it's conceptually, it's the same, but it's defined differently. If it's a philosophy, it, you know, it's a different philosophy in the community, but haptics, it was developed in another country in 2010. And the team flew to another location and started teaching it. And it has, you know, man, it has made its way to the United States from there. Brenda, I have another question. Do you have any technology that you use to support your vision? Like, you know, um, an iPhone that you can't read, but you can feel the braille on it for the future or any other technologies? Do you use a cane or I'm just curious, are there any technologies that you use that support you? Right now I do use a cane. And that uh, device that I, that portable thing, I do have an iPhone, um, yay. <laughs> they have a nice large screen now. I do have a keyboard. It's not, it's, it's like a normal keyboard, but it is white. The letters are not small, however. Most letters are, the letters are big actually on this keyboard so that I can see the letters. And they're yellow. And, and on a computer, I have to zoom in. So I have to have a special program. Deafblind children, I'm hoping for school that they have a zoom in program as an option for their schooling on the computer. So I'm able to zoom in and out. I also change the colors of the background and change the colors of the font to accommodate my needs. And when I have Braille yet yeah, in the future, Yes, my iPhone will assist me with that also. And regarding deafblind children, I recommend something called an I can I can connect program. I can connect. 
And you can apply and fill out and get one of these things. If it's for children and adults, but it, it wants to know what kind of technology that you need and they're able to help provide those technologies. Oh, cool. Thank you. So I suggest that our audience, if you want to know about technology, go ahead and look on I Can Connect, the agency, fill out the application, and they will be glad to support you find the right tech to find the right technology. Thank you. Connie has a question. It says, you appear happy and healthy. How can you, let me back up. Sorry, let me back up. <laughs> okay. You seem to be happy and healthy and everything's doing good. So what do you do good to make sure that you keep that same mindset, your emotions, everything in check? That is a great question. And to be honest with, honest with you, it's not easy. You know, I take one day at a time. When tomorrow isn't promised. We don't know what's going to happen. So I focus on today. And every day is a new day. When I wake up, I, I, you know, I realize, okay, today is what it is. I'm going to do the best with what I have. And someday I may wake up and have, you know, uh, have a bad day. So I have good days and bad days, you know, like a bad hair day and a good hair day. I have a bad day and good day vision day. So I just, I just take one day at a time. I don't pressure myself you know, things that I have to do. If it's a great day, I, I do good. You know, I have a job and, and my job is very flexible. The schedule is very flexible. And because because some days I wake up and I cannot see very well, my eyes are absolutely exhausted. And I, I it's important for my eyes to not be overstressed and not overdo it. Because if, that, and if, if I do, my eye sight, whatever is left will go quickly. So with deafblind children, If we're thinking about, you know, if if a deafblind daughter wants to marry, I would suggest having a C-section instead of a natural birth because in research I have found that natural birth is too much stress on the eyes. And it it can affect vision and make vision go away much quicker than the stress, less stress of a C-section. And that's something that I learned. So with my, I didn't know that with my son, I learned that with my, when I birthed my daughter. So some deafblind individuals have natural birth and I noticed their vision definitely decreases much faster with each natural birth. So, hey, note to self on that one. You know, natural birth, you may want it, but visually your vision is really important. You know, your vision has to come first. And, you know, how do we navigate the environment with impaired vision? It's a great question. Oh, good answer. Angela said, yes, I can connect. And it's important to connect and help your daughter. Yes. The I can connect really helped my daughter. Mm -hmm. Brenda, could you hold on a minute? Tracy wants to say something. Tracy has a question that says, AAP and CDC recommend that all children who are identified as deaf must have a vision evaluation within the first year of life. Yes. And it's really important to have a vision screening for concerns. So that is really, I'm not sure if that was the question, but yeah. Just an FYI for the audience to know that it, it, it's really important to get a vision screening. Yes, definitely. Okay, Brenda has a question. Oh, I know I'm just full of questions, but the deaf blind community, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know there's some variations in vision. Some, uh, the vision goes dark really quickly. So what do you suggest, meaning do you go to bed early or have all the lights on or what do you suggest in order to keep your eyes at a level playing field? I'm just curious. 
I do. Yes, I need to sleep well. If I'm exhausted or fatigued and I don't get any sleep, I do notice that my eyes, uh, I, I struggle reading. So I have to, you know, break after 10 minutes of reading. I also need to eat healthy. I love spinach. Love it, love it, love it every single day of my life. And spinach is awesome for our eye health. Of course, water is as well. And your body needs water anyways. And of course, rest. And then, did I miss something? That's pretty much. So at night, less at nighttime, less activities. Is that right? What does that mean, less at night? I'm not sure. What you're at saying. nighttime, you know, people who can't see, who it's dark. Typically, what do you do at nighttime? I'm just curious. Not much. <laughs> not much. I stay at home. <laughs> During the daytime, I can get about my business and do things. But at night is a, definitely a lot more laid back. Okay. Thank you. Sharon has one more question. I think this is probably going to be our last question if no one else has anything. I wanted to add, I went to the Helen Keller National Training Center for a week and I learned that many deaf blind trainings were offered on how to identify clothing, how to cook, how to use the computer, Mm -hmm. how to do your job, all these different things. So is there anything that you would add to that? What do you mean to add? What am to I adding? training at the Helen Keller, the trainings that Helen Keller provides at the Helen Keller Center, like cooking, just anything that they. Sure. The cooking. Okay. Keep. I'm tracking you. I'm tracking you. The Helen Keller Training Center really teaches independence, whether that be cooking or um, using a cane, transportation, how to use, uh, you know, how to identify money because you can't see what the denomination is on the money. So you, you can fold it different ways on the corner to know what denomination each bill is. And so, you know, how to function within the home. They, they teach all of that. In addition, um, they have a lot of technology that is accommodating for deaf, uh, help, helps accommodate deaf blind individuals, whether it's something that you carry in your pocket, whether it vibrates, lights up, you know, doorbells and light switches and things like that. So, yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so we're nearing the end. We've got four minutes left of the event. Anybody else have any burning questions? Now is your time. If none, then we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Before we wrap it up, I really wanted to thank you for your time, for showing up, for explaining your life, your background, your experiences. I'm sure everyone here has learned a lot. I know I sure did. And knowing if you want to know more about the deafblind community, Usher syndrome, you can contact us and we can put you in connection with Laura and you can have a deep conversation if need be. But there are different agencies in Tennessee as well, so we can connect you to them as well. Contact us anytime if you need resources. Many people are saying thank you, thank you, thank you in the chat. We appreciate your time. And the, and the information, it's so very valuable. Yes, thank you. So you can go ahead and open your screens and we'll all say goodbye and then we'll all be gone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, and y'all are welcome to leave. Laura, you can go if you want to. All righty, thank you so much for your time. Take care, bye-bye.